Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are so excited to have you with us tonight. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. And thanks so much for helping spread the word about this podcast. It is growing and growing and that's all due to your help. We have a fantastic, fantastic show for you today. We're talking about the value of reading with our older kids with author Tina Shepherdson. Before we invite Tina in, I want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is being sponsored by The Last Surviving Dinosaur. You know, reading with your kids is often about reading out loud with your kids. And what would make a better read out loud book than a book that has six cranky relatives, three mean dinosaurs, and one very cranky Tyrannosaurus? The book is called The Last Surviving Dinosaur, the Tyrannocrankosaurus, written by Stephen Joseph and playfully illustrated by Andy Case. The book tells the tale of how the dinosaurs became extinct and not in the life-ending meteor shower that paleontologists often cite. The the Tyrannocrankosaurus is so cranky that she makes all the other bigger and meaner dinosaurs disappear. That is, until she comes across the only dinosaur who is immune to her incessant complaining, the Tyrannocrankosaurus. These two dinosaurs evolved into humans, and that's where cranky people come from. Throughout the illustrated book, family members and dinosaurs humorously battle to have the best saurus. Now, that's a Yiddish word for big, big, really big problems, including warts, alligator attacks, and brain tumors. Poor cousin Dottie grew an entire forest on her feet. Oi! And the best part of this very funny book is that it's not just for cranky kids. As the storyteller says in the end, even mommy and daddy can be a crankosaurus and a kvetchosaurus sometimes. As it turns out, everyone has a bit of Taranto crankosaurus and Taranto kvetchosaurus in him or her. The Last Surviving Dinosaur reminds readers to be mindful of when and how often they complain, a lesson from which all readers, young and old, can, can benefit. And it's fun to read. I mean, if you're enjoying hearing me stumble over pronouncing Taranto Crankosaurus, imagine how much fun your kids are going to have listening to you trying to pronounce Taranto Kvetchosaurus. It really is a fun book. It's available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other sites where books are sold. It's The Last Surviving Dinosaur by Stephen Joseph. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by our friends at Familius Publishing. We've had so many amazing authors on the show from Familius. One of my favorites was Vivian Miniker. She illustrated uh, Familius' brand new publication of Robert Frost's of Road, The Road Not Taken. It really is a spectacularly beautiful book. And that is what Familius is known for, just publishing really quality books. Familius is a global trade publishing company that publishes books and other content to help families be happy. They believe that the family is the fundamental unit of society and that happy families are the foundation of a happy life. They recognize that every family looks different and they passionately believe in helping all families find greater joy. To that end, Familius publishes books for children and adults that invite families to live the Familius Nine Habits of Happy Family Life. Love together, play together, learn together, work together, talk together, heal together, read together, eat together, and laugh together. Check them out at Familius.com. That's F-A-M-I-L-I-U-S, Familius.com, and follow them at Familius Talk on Instagram to learn more about all the great titles that are available and, and stay up to date with all their latest releases. Familius Publishing. Joining us right now from the Syracuse, New York area, one of my favorite parts of the world. And and from from like April till October. It's one of my favorite parts of the world. Touring up in Syracuse in November, December, January, it's really hard 
because it gets really cold and they never call off school. Minus 25 degrees one time they had school. I went, I performed. I had a great time. I love Syracuse and I love the fact that we have an, an aspiring soon to be debut, uh, author and she is also a middle school teacher. Please welcome to the show, Tina Shepherdson. Tina, how are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me today. I am really excited to have you here today. Tina's new picture book uh, is set to debut sometime in the near future. It's called mm-hmm. Walkout. Can you give us a little quick preview of what Walkout is about? Sure. Um, it's based on a true story of uh, last year when there was a school walkout ah, mm-hmm. after the Stoneman Douglas uh, shootings, mm-hmm. and many kids wanted to be a part of it. Um, there were some younger children that couldn't be a part of it, and so it was based on an article that I had read in the New York Post. So the story is about two girls, Maddie and Stella, and Maddie wants to be a part of the walkout in her school uh, they're in the younger grades, and the principal said it's only for the older grades. So it's about the girls' friendship and Stella realizing that she wants to be a part of it, even though initially she's very afraid. Um, and so in the end, she, she does become a part of it, but I, I, it's a surprise in the way that they do it. Excellent. Well, we can't wait for that book to be released and we're going to talk, uh, invite Tina back on when it gets released. The reason I invited Tina on today is because we've mentioned a lot, obviously the name of the show is Reading With Your Kids and we do mention a lot of the value of not only reading with our, our young kids cuddled up on the couch, but it's really important to read to our kids once they start reading on their own and when they get into middle school and high school. And, and, and I come from it, come at it from a purely kind of anecdotal point of view. You know, I just loved co-reading with my kids and I thought it was a, uh, the start of this beautiful conversation that's been going on with my kids since they were little babies and now they're getting married and starting their careers and we still have this conversation. But Tina's, Tina's an expert. She has some facts. She's a teacher and she's going to be able to share uh, some more concrete reasons why it's important for us to read with our older kids. So, um, where do you want to start with this conversation? I think nowadays with the digital era and we spend so much time on our devices, a great way to continue to have kids to read in the middle school ages is to model that you like to read as well. Mm -hmm. If we're always on our devices, we really can't be surprised to see our kids on their devices. So I think if we would like to see them continue to build their skills in reading, we need to model that same behavior. Absolutely. You know, LeVar Burton, the host of Reading Rainbow and also his new podcast, LeVar Burton Reads, uh, he was he was on the show and he shared when I asked him where his love and passion for reading and advocating for reading came from. He said it's from my mom, seeing my mom always always reading either a newspaper or a novel or having two or three novels that she was reading at the same time, and and it was he credits it all to his mom and that role model that that she was for him. I I totally agree with that. There were a few families that um, over the years I've taught, these students are voracious readers. And in parent-teacher conference time, I would say, may I ask what you've done to instill such a love of reading? And that's always what was said. We read together as a family. They see us reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so important. And and, and by the way, parents, if, uh, if you don't already know this, Being a great role model by picking up a book and reading, not only is it great for your kids, it's great for you too. It's really, it's really fun. And I'm, I'm staying because I read probably, and and between when I say read, it's I experience a lot of books through audio books and, but, but I'm out there experiencing books and probably 50, 60, maybe 70 a year. And it's sometimes it's in the van with the audio books. Sometimes it's at the gym with my Kindle. Uh, but I just, I love books and it's, uh, I can't imagine not reading books. I agree. Yeah. It's a great pastime and it's a great way to just, you know, unwind and journey into another 
uh, story. Mm-hmm. So obviously, so so getting our kids off the video games, because a lot of kids are going to be reading through their Kindle, so they'll still be looking at a yeah. screen, but they'll be looking at text, and they'll be required to use their imaginations to kind of see what they're reading and kind of go along. What other kind of benefits? We, we know that with, with our young kids, if we're reading to our two and three and four year olds, that over the course of a year, those kids will be exposed to, uh, I, I, I forget the, the exact number, but, but thousands more words, words in a year than, than their peers that, that, that aren't read to. Uh, it, it, do middle school kids and high school kids get that same kind of advantage? Yeah, you mean the difference between reading books and reading digitally? Uh, not so much that, but just the fact that, that we're reading with our kids and motivating our kids in, in middle school and high school to read. Uh, what are the kind of really kind of concrete things uh, do they get out of that? Well, they get exposure. So if you're still reading, which is awesome with your kids at this age level, they're really getting experience with hearing fluency, uh, voice um, inflection, mm-hmm. uh, articulation, word building, and they're all things, even with my own middle school students, we read a lot of uh, our, even our informational texts to the kids so that they can have that modeling, hear that fluency, and identify the words with the text because they'll read along as we read. Mm-hmm. And And I've heard that there are a lot of kids, say, uh, you know, a, a 10, 11, 12-year-old, <laughs> They might be reading, hopefully on grade level, 10, 10 or right. 12 year old level, but they can listen on a higher level. Yes. Uh, sometimes for kids that read on a lower level, they really benefit from having that Kindle or that digital text, mm-hmm. be- especially because it has that audio component. Uh-huh. And it is such good practice for them to help them build their words as well as their comprehension if they can listen and follow along. And as you and I both know, those screens are so captivating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it really does does captivate them. And and you were mentioning that you read aloud the the instructional things with your kids and they follow along. Is Does that make it easier for them? Is there a value for them to be experiencing that information two different ways with two different parts of their brain? Yeah, so often that first exposure, especially with informational text or nonfiction text, we always, um, in our new reading program this year, read it to them orally because sometimes the words are a little bit difficult for them. Mm -hmm. So if they can hear it and follow along, Then they do a closer read a second time and a third time where they'll read it together in group, but yet we'll give them a question. They'll have a purpose for reading it more closely. So by the time they've maybe looked at a specific excerpt a third time, they definitely understand it much better than if I had just given it to them and said, read this on your own Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and answer these questions. Yeah. While we're a little bit off subject here, but um, teacher, I think teaching and education has changed so much over the mm-hmm. years. It has. Um, tell us how it's changed the biggest, and also just talk about the the new challenges that all the standardized testing presents to teachers and also to kids. So how it's changed, it's, this is my 30th year, so I've seen it really come full circle. Mm-hmm. It used to be, you know, it's very important to have the kids read, just make sure that they're reading. And over time, we've really discovered kids need to have exposure to various genre, not just um, narrative structure and story arcs. They need to have informational text and nonfiction, and they be, need to be able to look at how both types of structures really communicate the written word and how can they connect to it. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. And so in the last five years, really since the Common Core Standards have been published, there has been a big push and drive for us in the content areas, not just reading Judley, even in science and social studies, to have the kids be exposed to informational text and really to teach them how to, how to read it and how to connect with it. And, uh, it, we're starting to see the kids really 
uh, make good gains in it. But in the very beginning, like in September, it's all new for them. Mm -hmm. And you have to really model and reinforce and walk them through the skills. But uh, even just today, my kids and I were just saying how far they've come. Excellent. The fall. Yeah. Excellent. And it is really different reading a story uh, as opposed to reading yeah. how to how to do this this test or how to put together this thing from IKEA. It is, and we're, our nonfiction text right now. So we've been exploring conservation efforts, fishing, fish depletion, overfishing, and my first ELA class is at seven thirty in the morning with my ten and eleven year olds. So I'm like, all right, guys, let's get excited about fish depletion. <laughs> and we start to really look at the text um, and discuss it. And they've really gotten into it. But it's so it's such a new approach for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How we, we're talking about devices and, and being models for our kids to to get them off the devices. How mm-hmm. how has have those devices and, and how have video games kind of changed? Have you noticed that they're, that they're changing kids? Are the kids you're teaching who've grown up with the video games and the flashy, you know, flashy devices, are they a different kid than you were teaching 30 years ago? Yeah, they're, you know, it's a, that's a great question. They're different in, a, in many ways. In some ways, they are more sophisticated, I think, than we were when we were kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they have so much more exposure on their devices to uh, preview and look at things. Um, they have more awareness of societal issues, I think, than we did at their ages. The other thing is that I think because on your devices things come so quickly, you know, your fingers work and answers come and information comes, that sometimes it's hard to get them to realize that it's going to take time to build a skill. It's going to take time to go back into a text to find information. Uh, that's where I really see a change. They are so used to everything being so instant. Mm-hmm. What about, you know, we're talking about, inf- and you're talking about the, you know, access to information. And uh-huh. one of the things that, that, that blows me away is that there are some kids who get it. And, you know, if a question pops up and it's like, uh, gee, I wonder how that works. Some kids will reach into their pocket, pull out their phone and go, how does that work? And they'll get the information. And meanwhile, other kids, you know, they might have their laptop open and their Kindle open and their phone right, right by their side. And they'll sit there and go, I don't know how this thing works. I don't know how I'll find, you know, they don't make that connection that they can actually go and, 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 and look for the information. Right. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, one of the questions that, that, that I'm wondering is, um, do kids seem more curious now that they have all of these devices and have access to all this information or is it kind of like an overload? They're definitely curious. Mm -hmm. Uh, If they feel overload, they don't really demonstrate it. They just love, like if we just did a project using a website called Storyboard That where they created comic strips based on the nonfiction text we're reading. I went through a YouTube to teach myself how to use it so that I could really show the kids. There's no need. They pick it up like sponges and they're, they, they just go to it. And I am just floored at what they can create in minutes. And I know it would take me at least an hour, mm-hmm. if not more, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> because it's such a natural language for them. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, I, I had an experience when, when, when my mom was still with us and my son was five uh-huh. years old. And my son, he loved, we, we got the CD ROMs out and he really enjoyed that. And that was, we would read a lot together and then we also do these great CD ROM things, storybooks yeah. together. And, uh, I got a, a computer from my mom and my mom used to help and take care of the kids a lot of the time. And mm-hmm. uh, I remember there was this one day um, that my mother was, was taking care of my son and she was having trouble getting the computer to work. And this little five-year-old just walked over and go, oh, no, you do it like this and and got the thing working. And it frustrated my mother so much that her five-year-old 
grandson could do this and she couldn't figure it out that she shut off the computer. She never picked it up again. So, That's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things about all the information that we have now is that a lot of the information that we have access to isn't accurate or is right. intentionally inaccurate. Mm-hmm. Do do kids get that? Are they learning that they have to do some vetting and 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 really examine whether or not what they're reading online is is true? Yes, um, our children have once a week a library class, and our librarian spends a lot of time teaching them about internet safety. Um, all of the ways to be able to look at a website, a URL, and be able to tell if it is real information or if it's false information. Um, we've even got some posters that are posted like on the stairs when the kids travel to different parts of the school and they've just got some pictures of um, websites. And you can tell what's real and what's not, which I think is excellent for the kids to be able to know at a young age. Oh, absolutely. It's, I mean, we need to know that stuff too, especially now with all the, uh, you know, all the controversy over the elections and foreign, uh, foreign governments trying to, you know, influence this country and uh, other countries. And I'm sure that yeah. we've, we've done the same in other countries. So it's, uh, yeah, we all have to have that, I, I guess, uh, when my kids were growing up, it was important for me that they be media literate and understand where their media was coming yeah. from. And I think we have to, our, our kids need to be media literate and internet li- literate too. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess one more thing since we've been talking so much about, about online and, and um, reading with our kids is I'm always, you know, one of the things I do when I do my educational magic shows and, and come into schools and I'll, I'll ask them, what, you know, are there certain issues that you need me to deal with here? And um, it, it hasn't happened at a middle school yet, thank goodness, and of course not at an elementary school. Uh, but at every high school that I've gone to, when I've asked that question, the principal, the guidance counselor will turn to me and say, can you tell them not to be sending inappropriate pictures of themselves online? Uh- well, and, 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 and I do figure out ways to put it into my magic shows and, and that, and, and that are appropriate. But w- how can we as parents kind of get that message across to our kids that, uh, everything that they put up online is public and it's out there forever? That's, a, that, that's a tough issue and it's a growing issue. And we've seen a little bit of that, uh, in our school as well, mm-hmm. in the middle school, um, as well as high school. I think as a family, we need to be connected frequently. And I think we need to have these conversations with our kids. I think um, even with our own daughter, yes, she had a phone, but there were boundaries. Mm -hmm. And we always talked to her about social media. We always explained that once you start that digital footprint, it doesn't go away. Um, And, in school, it's also carried over again. Our librarian does a wonderful job in class when we're doing projects online, just having those conversations, keeping that door open. It, it is difficult because you and I both know when we were kids, you think you're invincible and nothing's mm-hmm. ever going to happen, but invariably it does. And in today's era, it's so different than what we would have experienced in our own era. Right, right. It, one of the things that, that really helped my kids um, when they were very young, uh, my mm-hmm. first website, I, I hired a company and they went out and they created this neat little website for me, but it cost me a ton of money. And every time if I wanted to change a, 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 mm-hmm. a, a, an exclamation point into a question mark, it would cost uh, $150, $200. And uh, the, the, the site had pictures of me and my kids when they were babies. So that when they were getting to be seven, eight, nine years old, mm-hmm. uh, they said, can you get that down? And I thought, well, it's going to cost a lot of money. Let me go out and figure out how to do this myself. So I did. I went out and I learned how to create my own website. And so uh, that old website, I it was taken down. I had no access to it. I didn't have the pictures on my computer. But... A year or two later, those pictures popped up and those web pages popped up. And so, and 
wasn't a big deal. They're, they're cute pictures and whatnot. But I sat down. I was able to sit down with my kids who were then maybe 10 and 8 years old. And, sat, and I sat down. I goes, look, kids, I, I took these down. I don't have these pictures anymore, but they're still out there. I've, I, there's no way that I can get those pictures down. And thank goodness it's not embarrassing, but th- right. this, you need to understand this, that they're, they're out there and they're out there forever. Right. And they need to learn good habits. I think just keeping that line of communication open. If you see something in the news that's appropriate to share with them, show them, you know, this is something that happened. This is something that could happen to you and your friends if you, if you don't make wise choices about what you're posting. Mm-hmm. Um, but it that in and of itself is another whole education for our kids today. Yeah. And which which this is beautiful because it just comes back full circle. These conversations that we're talking about having with our middle school kids, with our high school kids, which are difficult to have Mm -hmm. when we begin those conversations when they're two and three years old, talking to kids about the books that we're reading to them and reading together with our kids and – and, and she, what do you think about what do you think about the bear? Is he wearing a silly hat? And why do you think that's silly? And and valuing the kids' opinions about this silly bear book, it gives them the confidence to talk to you about other things, and and also just it gets you into habit of, about talking about issues in a more comfortable way. Yeah, and they feel safe mm-hmm. when you come across to them, you know, as. Uh, open, you know, not argumentative, um, and not lecturing. Sometimes kids can feel mom and dad be a little lecturing. Um, I think the, the more you can do that, the, the better it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're excited that Walkout is going to be available at some point in the future. We're not sure yet. When we, is when it's out, we're going to know we're going to invite Tina back. But is there a place online where people can, um, connect with you, learn a little bit more about you, and maybe get some previews on Walkout? Sure. Um, they can go to my website, which is uh, tinashepardson.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter, at Shepardson Tina. And um, I'm on Facebook as well, uh, Tina Shepardson. You, you, and I was going to say, ahead, my I, I was gonna say you're, you're like me. I'm, I'm at, at Magic Jedly on one thing and at yeah. Jedly Magic on the other <laughs> <laughs> try try to keep it simple. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we've had such a pleasure talking to Tina Shepardson today. Her new book, Walk Out, will be available at some point in the future. But in the meantime, we've had such a, a really valuable experience talking talking with Tina, who is a middle school educator, talking to her about the value and how important it is and how valuable it is to continue to read with our kids when they're in middle school, <laughs> when they're in high school. Tina, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Judley. It's been a pleasure. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Naive Reynoso. She is the author of Be Bold, Be Brave, 11 Latinas Who Made U.S. History. It really is a fascinating conversation you do not want to miss. Hey, if you're an author, you do not want um, to miss an opportunity to let the world know about your great book by being a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Being a guest, it's fun, it's easy, and it gives you a chance to tell thousands and thousands of people about your fantastic children's book. All you need to do is to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, click on the contact button, let my amazing producer, Fatima Khan, know all about your book. She will let you know the next easy steps. Hey, we want to thank Tina Shepardson for joining us today and sharing with us her views and the value of reading with older kids. We also want to thank our sponsor, Stephen Joseph, the author of The Last Surviving Dinosaur, the Tyrannocrankosaurus. And we also want to thank our friends at Familius Publishing. And of course, I want to thank my producer, Fatima. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support that she gives me. And I want to thank you. Thank you so much for for letting the world know about this podcast. Thank you for subscribing to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Podbean, on Podcast Attic, on Himalaya, wherever you find your podcasts. And most of all, thank you so much for helping to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.